High Court judge rules that victims' rights come before those of paedophiles. Not something I ever thought I would hear myself say, as it shouldn't need the court to tell us that. Manchester police have been taking lessons from their Yorkshire counterparts after they used their discretion to not pursue charges against a sexual assault suspect, who later went on a spree. Alphabet people homeschooling materials blasted after reference to love has no age limits. And 10 months jail for police constable with sticky fingers. This and more coming up. Don't forget, these reports are daily, Monday to Friday. Please remember to subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss any future uploads. And if you do appreciate the work I do and understand that these topics result in little to no YouTube monetization, please consider joining the channel Patreon for as little as just £3 a month to help me continue providing you with this content. Hello ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, innies, outies, and of course in between us, my name's Dan. Welcome back to another Pat Reports. It is now Thursday, July 16th, 2020. On the 3rd of June, we spoke about how 37-year-old Mark Sutherland was caught by paedophile hunters Groom Resistor Scotland and subsequently brought a High Court case against his conviction, arguing that his rights to a private life, Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights, had been breached. I wonder if he was thinking of the rights of the children he was attempting to groom. Well, this case has now been heard. In the report in June, I said that if this was upheld, it would be a devastating um, move, given paedophiles across the country the right to appeal many convictions. However, thankfully, judges at the High Court on Wednesday unanimously dismissed the appeal, which argued the evidence from vigilante groups breached a person's right to a private life. The ruling said that the interests of children have priority over any interest a paedophile could have in being allowed to engage in criminal conduct. Lord Sales delivered the judgment via video link, stating that the panel of five justices found there was no interference with the accused rights under Article 8. He said this was for two reasons. The first being that the activity in question should be capable of respect and that children also have rights. Lord Sales said the state had a special responsibility to protect children against sexual exploitation by adults. This indicates that there is no protection under Article 8 for the communications by the accused in this case, he said. The interests of the children have priority over any interest a paedophile could have in being allowed to engage in the criminal conduct in issue here. The state must deter offences against children and so prosecutors were entitled to use the evidence gathered by Groom Resistors Scotland to secure a conviction. Secondly, he said Sutherland had no reasonable expectation of privacy in the circumstances. There was no prior relationship between the accused, Sutherland, and the decoy from Groom Resistor Scotland, from which an expectation of privacy could be said to arise. In addition, the accused believed he was communicating with a 13-year-old child, and it was foreseeable that a child of that age might share any worrying communications with an adult. He added that prosecutors had no additional positive obligation to protect Sutherland's interest in any way that would prevent the prosecutor making use of the evidence to prosecute the crimes. The great thing about this is that it's now set. Set that pedos' rights come second to those of their victims, whereas we've seen many pedos that seem to be treated better than the actual victims of their offending. Bradford City footballer Ben Richards Everton is considering making a formal complaint against West Midlands police after he was stopped and handcuffed during a search. Now before you jump on the police on this one, accusing them of excessive force, assault etc, you need to understand the reasons for this and why I personally think this is someone simply looking for a bit of media attention. Ben Richards Everton was stopped by police as he left the shop in Sutton Coldfield near Birmingham after police say the vehicle flagged up on their AMPR system as being linked to drugs and firearms. As they get out of the vehicle, his girlfriend started recording on her mobile, which of course is the right thing to do, although the recording should have started as soon as the interaction did. I'm going to cut your face, do I? Great, it's good. Never give her a phone. Yeah, that's fine. This is Make ridiculous. sure you're recording this. Oh, this is disgraceful. For what? This is disgraceful. What's going on right now? You're doing this to me when I'm fully legal. 
Because I've got a nice car. You yeah, pointed yeah. a taser at me. I didn't point it at you. Yes, you did. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't point it at you. If you look on what, that camera, look at that. For? It wasn't pointed at you. It was so out, but it wasn't pointed what at you. Be, be careful what you say. Well, no, I'll, do, I'll do what I want. Say, say the right no, thing. I don't care. Say the right thing. No, no, get. Listen to me. You put me. Don't make things up. Say the right thing. For what? You hate haters because I'm driving a nice car. I see it's from my life, man. Now. As you can see, the guy is almost twice the size of the cop handcuffing him. There's alleged intelligence that the vehicle is linked to drugs and firearms. Whether he was being compliant at the time or not, in my personal view, the police have to take precautions to protect themselves and members of the public. As I'm sure there isn't anyone watching here who simply would be happy to allow him to wander around while your backs are turned searching the vehicle. West Midlands Police said they detained the car driver while officers carried out a search as the number plate flagged up warning markers for drugs and firearms. Nothing was found in the car and is now thought that the number plates that, which sparked the suspicion are cloned. Given the intelligence around potential firearms, one of the officers drew a taser. It was put away shortly after without being used. Now, unless there wasn't an AMPR hit, you know, if it can't be proven, then yeah, this could well be a malicious stop. However, if it was malicious, the chances are they would have tried more to pin on him rather than simply sticking to the alleged reason they stopped him in the first place and then leaving after they're satisfied that there's nothing wrong. I've seen a lot of these stops and I genuinely believe in my opinion that the police in this one, based on what we can see from the camera footage, acted appropriately in the circumstances. Let's face it, if the guy was involved with drugs and firearms, and he could have been violent at some point. And based on the size of the Mpalumpas stopping him, he'd have walked all over them, therefore potentially putting the public at risk as well. Now, I know there will be differing opinions on this, and that's absolutely fine, but let me hear your thoughts in the comments. Hillingdon Hospital A&E Department, located in Boris Johnson's constituency, has been investigated after 70 staff were said to have had to go into quarantine due to an outbreak of covid this meant that the hospital had to stop accepting emergency admissions. The source of the outbreak has been said to have been traced back to a training day where nurses failed to wear face masks or stay two metres apart. Does anyone else find it strange that those people preaching about how bad it is should simply ignore the advice given to everyone else? Especially as these are the people who are supposed to be seeing how bad it is and dealing with people on the front line supposed to be dying from it. Hospital sources say that not everyone who attended wore a mask or stayed two metres apart and that social distancing broke down to a significant extent during the lunch break, which some people have blasted, seeing that most medical training in the NHS at the moment is being carried out online in order to prevent these large gatherings. The ongoing inquiry is being undertaken by senior trust executives in tandem with officials from Public Health England, Hillingdon Council's public health team and NHS England. They have pinpointed the training session's key role in spreading the virus. The nurse who passed on the infection is thought to have contracted COVID-19 from a patient, a man who had recently returned from abroad who was being treated for the disease in the hospital's acute medical unit. The nurse became increasingly ill during a training session and ended up being taken to the hospital's A&E. There is no suggestion at the moment that she acted inappropriately. The 16 others she infected worked alongside her in that unit or in the hospital's A&E department. A hospital spokesperson said there is an ongoing investigation into the outbreak of COVID-19 at Hellingdon Hospital. Our priority is to maintain safe and high quality care, and the trust is taking appropriate actions to reduce transmission in line with Public Health England guidance. Personally, I'd call it willful neglect, and, and that's why this story has been added to this report. These are medical professionals who are allegedly dealing with coronavirus patients. They allegedly know how infectious it can be and allegedly how deadly it can be. But yet the nurses who transmitted it to others is said to have not acted inappropriately. I, mean, I wonder how she got it in the first place if she was wearing a mask at work and following protection procedures. Ex-Northumbria Police Constable PC Malcolm Bennett. We spoke of his misconduct hearing on the 13th over allegations that he unlawfully accessed police systems on multiple occasions to get information on separate women, the same two or two of those women uh, that he was accused of having sexual relationships with, even though they were vulnerable victims of crime. Bennett faced a total of five allegations of gross misconduct. The hearing was held on Monday. 
has found that all five allegations against him were proven. During the hearing, it was said that Bennett visited the women whilst on duty and wearing his uniform, having driven to their homes in a police vehicle. He also unlawfully accessed police computer systems for information about two other vulnerable women to whom he sent texts of a sexual nature. The initial investigation by the IOPC ended in August 2018 and Bennett retired from the police in the following month. Got to save that pension. Following the misconduct hearing, Miranda Biddle, the IOPC's regional director, said officers who abuse their position of trust and power by seeking and engaging in improper sexual relationships have no place in policing. Superintendent Steve Amari, Northumbria Police's Head of Professional Standards, described Bennett's actions as completely unacceptable. Following the IOPC's ruling, he has also been barred from returning to policing. Greater Manchester Police seem to be taking lessons from their Yorkshire counterparts, as it's emerged that 51-year-old Jason Bursk, who's been described as a deviant sexual predator, was reported in 2012 for a sexual assault, However, Greater Manchester Police took the decision not to charge him, didn't take DNA and didn't send a file to the Crown Prosecution Service for assessment because they used their discretion in assuming there wasn't enough evidence. However, seven years later, his 2012 victim saw him again, this time in a police appeal. Taxi driver Bursk left Radcliffe where the 2012 assault happened, moved to Blackley. He returned to the Berry town with his wife and three children in 2018 and within weeks, he had sexually assaulted a woman in her 70s. Bursk's elderly victim woke up to find him in her bedroom after he had turned the lights off. He pinned her down, placed his hand over her mouth when she screamed, before running off when she kicked out at him. Bursk then went on a year-long trespassing spree attempting to get into people's homes with the intention of committing sexual offences. On February the 22nd last year, he tried a door of a house in Radcliffe. He didn't get in. On April the 5th, he did get inside another house. A woman was alerted by a security system that the front door was open. She went downstairs and secured the front door, thinking it may have been left accidentally insecure. She had unknowingly locked herself in the house with Bursk. By that point, he was about to go into a child's bedroom. The woman's dog sensed the intruder and started barking. Getting spooked, Bursk ran downstairs and ran off. In May 2019, Bursk was seen loitering in front of another home nearby. In the early hours of July 13th, 2019, he was caught red-handed trying to front and back doors of another property. That incident was reported to the police, but the decision made not to pursue it. That decision was later criticised in a Greater Manchester Police internal review, which said the matter should have been investigated as an attempted burglary. On November 15th, 2019, in the early hours, Bursk attempted but failed to get into another house in Radcliffe. He tried another house on the same street and got in through the back door. Once inside, he sexually assaulted and attempted to rape a child under 13. He spent 32 minutes in the house. After assaulting a child, Bursk bit his victim and called her a brat as she turned away and buried her head in a teddy bear as he tried to rape her. It's only now that the numerous attempts the police had to stop Bursk have come to light. At Minshall Street Crown Court, Bursk of Overton Close Radcliffe admitted two counts of sexual assault on a child under 13, one count of attempted rape on a child under 13, one count of sexually assaulting a woman in her 70s, three counts of attempting trespass with intent to commit a sexual offence, and four counts of trespass with intent to commit sexual offences. Police have insisted that this case would have been handled differently these days. Detective Superintendent Howard Millington said he was originally uh, arrested and interviewed in 2012. It was reviewed by a detective inspector, detective sergeant and another detective inspector. Based on the evidence at the time, they felt there was insufficient evidence to proceed with it. It was in isolation, wasn't linked to any other crimes based on what they knew. They made that particular decision. It was felt that without any corroborating evidence, the fact that he had no previous convictions for anything like that, it was felt that there, was insuffi there wasn't sufficient evidence evidence to charge and it wasn't put to the CPS. His DNA was not taken at the time with the benefit of hindsight. What I have to say is there have been a lot of developments since then. This is not making excuses, it is a fact. We went through a big period of austerity and that included the CPS. Now we would have not only put in a file to a CPS for a reviewing lawyer to give advice, we have specialist lawyers for rape and sexual serious sexual offences. 
things have moved on and improved organisationally, both with the CPS and the police. If that case was to happen now, it would go to the CPS and would get the full consideration of a reviewing lawyer. Clearly, with his recent offending and propensity for vulnerable females, that lends weight to the evidence from 2012. When we put the media image of him out, the victim from 2012 rang in and said, I reported him in 2012. We would have gone back to her anyway, as we had this on records. It was said that after Bursk assaulted a 70-year-old, they did manage to find a partial DNA profile, but as police failed to take a DNA from the first recorded offence, they had no match in the system. However, that match was enhanced as DNA from subsequent offences were matched to that first profile, and when they finally did take DNA from Bursk, they confirmed the match. Greater Manchester Police's plagued new IOPS computer system was also said to have been in being implemented, which led to major problems for the force and backlogs in supplying information to officers. But Superintendent Millington said a crime was not submitted regardless of the system, so we can't say it was anything to do with IOPS. But not a mention of an apology or any action against those who failed in their duties, which enabled this piece of shit to go on and commit multiple more assaults and ruin many lives. George Byazda has been under fire after supplying parents with home learning packs produced by diversity role models, which were said to have been normalising paedophilia. Angry parents lashed out after the packs sent by email targeting primary school aged children, which included reference to love has no age limit. Diversity role models says its mission is to foster an LGBT plus inclusive environment where students are empowered to embrace difference and then bullying and end bullying they said we believe every child and young person deserves the opportunity to be successful in their school career and their differences to be understood and celebrated not quite sure how trying to intimate that age doesn't matter at their age is going to help them be successful in their school career or embrace difference and end bullying they said our home learning packs are a resource that has been created to support parents or carers with homeschooling the intention is for these to be used by adults to enable open conversations on LGBT plus issues with their children. We recognise that some of the material in the pack has been misinterpreted and we want to reiterate that DRM unequivocally, unequivocally, don't, do not condemn anything. We recognise that some of the material in the pack has been misinterpreted and that we want to reiterate that DRM unequivocally commends that DRM certainly condemns anything that is or could be interpreted as supporting paedophilia or harm to children. We would like to thank those who raised the concern about our materials and reaffirm that we, are, we all share the fundamental principles to safeguard all children. The home learning packs have now had their wording changed after the complaints. Ex Avon and Somerset Police Constable Tim Silverwood appeared in PAP reports on the 18th of June and 10th of July due to the fact he was accused of stealing £2,750 and €550 Euros from another person on October 16th, 2019, whilst he was on duty in Bridgewater. 45 year old Silverwood appeared at Bristol Magistrates Court after being arrested and on June 18th admitted the theft. Yesterday, Wednesday, the 15th of July, he appeared again, this time at Bristol Crown Court where it was heard that Silverwood was on duty in Bridgewater on the 16th of October when he was approached by a woman who he thought was a member of the public and handed what he thought was a stolen bag found in a lay-by. He was told it had money in it, some of which he stole. The court then heard the woman who handed him the money was an undercover officer with the police's professional standards department. <laughs> Silverwood later told colleagues he did not know why he had stolen the money but denied his £40,000 debts were his motive. The court heard he had been suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder after attending a sudden death. So another mental health excuse then. I mean, that one's really getting old. You know, at least mix it up a bit and use something else for a, as a defence. Well, after being dismissed last week after the misconduct hearing, Silverwood has also found himself landed with a 10-month jail sentence. Although I've yet been able to find out whether it's a suspended sentence or not. And even a Somerset police constable who the force have refused to identify is to face a misconduct hearing, having been accused of having business links to criminals. 
identified only as W, the constable will face a misconduct hearing over allegations he had known a business owner since 2009 who associated with people linked to crime and that in 2016 he gained a financial interest in that business. Also that W failed to disclose the true nature of his association with the business owner or the extent of his own association with individuals involved in criminality. Along with accusations of accessing information on the police system for a purpose not related to his duties, the hearing is set for July 20th and if the allegations are proven then they will result in gross misconduct which should mean automatic dismissal. A complaint has been made about Suffolk Police after two constables were filmed conducting a vehicle stop. Ingrid Antoine Onikoyi and husband Falil were asked for their details after parking their car outside their mum's house after allegedly paying a neighbour attention, which the police found to be suspicious behaviour and so wanted to verify the legalities of the drivers. driver. During the interaction, the female police constable said to Antoine that she was jumping on the bandwagon. Antoine's daughter shared the video online, which has been viewed more than two million times, and said it's suspicious to walk from your car to your house while black. The UK is not innocent. After the incident, Suffolk Police said it was due to give a formal apology to the couple and said the Joint Norfolk and Suffolk Professional Standards Department have recorded a complaint and referred the matter to the IOPC, who are conducting an investigation. A fourth spokesperson said the case was voluntarily referred to the IOPC, which would conduct an independent investigation into the complaint, and therefore it would not be appropriate for the force to comment further at this time. The IOPC confirmed it had started an investigation. On the 13th of July, I was trying to get information about ex-Gloucestershire Police Sergeant David Anthony Walker. Well, Walker is the name that was said back then, however, an email I got now says Wallace. So I'm not sure whether it's a mistake, which is a mistake and which is his real name. Anyway, whatever his name is, he was accused of being disrespectful, sexual and or sexist to colleagues and in doing so breaching the police standards of authority, respect and courtesy, discreditable conduct and orders and instructions. The former sergeant, who did not attend his hearing in person, but did provide a written statement in which he admitted to the allegations, was found to have committed gross misconduct. He retired on the 5th of July 2019. However, after the allegations being proven, the Chief Constable said that he had not, had he not retired, he would have been sacked. He has also been placed on the College of Police's barred list, which although is growing at a steady pace, certainly hasn't all the police that deserve to be on it, actually on it. Deputy Chief Constable Jonathan Stratford said, These were very serious incidents involving female members of our constabulary who have shown great courage throughout this process. The behaviours were abhorrent and not representative of our values. David Wallace was a sergeant, someone who we trusted to take care of our colleagues. He abused that trust and his position. There is certainly no place for individuals like this within Gloucestershire Constabulary. I hope this shows the public that where we do receive allegations of misconduct, we will investigate, hold those responsible to account, <coughs> and when necessary, take firm disciplinary action. Big thank you to all the supporters of the channel, especially the channel Patreon supporters. Your support is much appreciated and really does help. And that's all I have for you today. Please like, share, comment and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts as I know many of you will. And until next time, stay safe, look after each other, film the police from the start of your interaction, not halfway through it, and other officials. Good night, all. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you like the content and you'd like to help support the channel, you can do so. In the description of every video, there are some links to ways that you're able to help support the channel so I can continue putting out content. If you're unable to help us in that way, hit that subscribe button up the top there. If you haven't already, become a subscriber. That is support enough. Share the videos, comment, like, it all helps. If you're looking for something else to watch, up top there is my latest video. Down the bottom there is a video that YouTube recommends for you.